Perfect. Uh, okay. Yep. I think I'm ready now. Yep, you're all set. Yep. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. And it really is early morning here um, I, in Moscow, Idaho. It's 6 o'clock in the morning, um, and it, the sun is just beginning to come out. Um, but I'm very happy to have a chance to uh, start uh, today's series of talks uh, with a focus on environmental composition or eco-composition. I often like to begin my lectures with this image on the first um, screen here, the first slide uh, taken by one of my former graduate students when I was at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, this image uh, suggests the fundamental connection between the human and the natural world, between the individual and both the specific location and the larger planet, uh, which I see indicated by the nearly full rainbow uh, in the distance. And then I also particularly like the, the spectral quality of the photographer's shadow in this opening slide, which to me implies that even when we're not obviously in connection with the natural world, when we're indoors, when we're in an extremely urban context, when we have no windows around us, we are on some fundamental level linked to, to the planet itself. Uh, it's very easy for us to forget this as we go about our busy human lives. And uh, in my mind, one of the purposes of eco-composition is to help us become more conscious of our fundamental reliance on the planet, our, our obvious and our subtler connections. So um, you know, that's what I'm attempting to symbolize with this opening slide. Um, so as Amy said in her introduction, I would like to offer some comments about uh, basic principles of eco-composition eco as I understand the field, and also to talk about a few fundamental paradigms of environmental thought and writing, which I summarize as place and animality. Um, and these, I believe, work in tandem with the basic building blocks of environmental writing. Um, I'm trying to... Um, move this slide. Okay, so for me, when I teach writing, I believe that context matters, that where the physical setting of our, our teaching, of our classroom, actually is very important, and it become, the place itself becomes a teaching tool. Um, whether we are in a relatively removed and abstract setting uh, without direct, uh, visible, or obvious connection to um, our, our place, or, or whether we are um, in obvious um, association with the place that we're writing about. So here are a few slides of uh, me a few years ago when I was teaching in Guangzhou, China. And actually, the first slide on the left shows a classroom of students listening to me talk about uh, environmental literature. It looks as if we're fully removed from the environment, but we're actually in a, in a classroom with no air conditioning and open windows, and we are feeling the heat and humidity of southeastern China in June. It's incredibly hot and humid, but we are in rather profound contact with the environment, although it feels like a relatively technological and um, a disconnected environment. Nonetheless, I did make a special effort toward the end of the class to bring the students outside um, have them sit on the ground, have them walk on the nearby mountain. As we talked about, um, actually I see the book on the ground in front of me as a literary theory book. So we're talking about theory, but we're in connection with the physical world. And I'm attempting to make some um, claims about the importance of concretizing and um, you know, experiencing in a sensory way um, um, our presence in the world. Um, now, um, for me, the experiential aspect is relevant to every type of writing we might do. Um, it need not be explicitly environmental, but particularly when we're thinking about the natural world and our various complex and uh, often troubled relationships with the world, it's particularly important to um, start with the experiential, with the concrete, with the sensory. And so often in my courses, I I try to boil things down to some fundamental building blocks, particularly for either uh, younger students who haven't thought much about writing in a very formal way, or even for more advanced students who don't necessarily think of themselves as expert writers. 
then I have used these building blocks even when working with um, professional science journalists offering them an intensive seminar in environmental writing just as a way of show, showing what some of the nuts and bolts might be that can then be interwoven in increasingly sophisticated ways. So I like to talk about descriptive writing, by which I particularly mean physical description, uh, narrative writing, how to talk about a sequence of events. Um, often we have a tendency, uh, I believe, um, uh, to um, quickly summarize events without presenting um, happenings, occurrences, in, in a vivid, uh, engaging way. And yet when we recognize narrative and description as distinct and um, special modes of expression, we, we can develop our skills at using these modes and use them more effectively. And then finally, although this is not absolutely separate, of course, from description and narration, I try to make people conscious of what it means when we move into a more expository or discursive mode, somewhat more abstract mode of communication. So I like to boil things down into these three basic building blocks, which I believe correspond quite well to core thematic paradigms of environmental literature, or it need not be high literature that I'm referring to, but environmental expression more generally. And here's where I get to these paradigms of place and animality. So I would argue that the physical and conceptual particularities of place, meaning a very precise and specific place or place more broadly, can be um, captured in careful descriptive writing. Our experiences of moving um, within place, and that this that need not uh, mean a dramatic uh, travel or journey from one distant place to another, but even in a small space like Henry David Thoreau traveling a good deal in Concord, Massachusetts, as he says in Walden, can be uh, the subject of a narrative, a story of some kind. And then finally, as we move toward that, that third building block of expository or discursive expression, um, exploring, for instance, the political complexities of managing a place or inhabiting, what does it mean to be home in a place? Um, this is um, appropriate for that third and somewhat more abstract mode of communication. As far as animality goes, that's a term that, that uh, many colleagues of mine and I use in the field of literature and environment to describe not only other species, but various aspects of human nature, both physical and psychological. So we can use the descriptive mode to talk about our animal experience and our encounters with other species and our efforts to describe their nature, their reality. Um, uh, to talk, for instance, about our interactions with other species would lead us into the narrative mode. And then um, when we contemplate the moral complexities of our relationships with, with other, other human beings and other uh, individuals or groups of, of different species, then we might well move into the discursive mode, or we might be making arguments about this. So place and animality, I believe, correspond quite well to these fundamental principles of, of environmental writing. Um, so when I, tend to, when I teach environmental writing, we tend to, to progress. I don't mean this in a completely hierarchical way, um, but um, more of a sequential way. We move from a more concrete mode um, to more abstract modes of communication. For instance, we start with various exercises in description and narration and then move to analysis and explanation and in some cases to argumentation. For instance, um, when I teach in the fall at, uh, in the new Semester in the Wild program, we'll be at uh, Taylor Ranch in the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness, a place which is a regular habitat for wolves. So I might well have the students writing about the sound of the wolves at night as they were falling asleep, describing um, in as um, uh, vivid and precise a way as possible that physical experience. And then gradually we'll move toward more abstract exploration of issues um, while still weaving in vividly experiential modes of expression. 
but we might, um, in conclusion, be, be contemplating issues related to wolf reintroduction in the American West and asking people to summarize other people's arguments, students to summarize other people's arguments, and then to articulate their own stance and defend their own stance um, in a more um, abstract and logical mode. So, Typically, like many of you, I imagine, I teach in a regular classroom context. This is the building at the University of Idaho called the Learning Commons, or the TLC, where I do much of my teaching. There are a lot of conveniences uh, to this. There are a lot of important reasons why we teach in these uh, regular classroom settings, not the least of which is access to, to uh, reading material and various tools that we've become reliant on for writing, such as computers and the internet. The drawback, especially if the subject matter for a course is something like um, uh, wild places and other species, which is the principal focus of the new semester in the wild program, is that the topic becomes um, frustratingly abstract. We are lacking in contact with the subject. It, it doesn't have any visceral meaning when we're sitting in an artificial environment. So, as Amy said in her introduction, I'm particularly preparing right now to teach this course in the largest wilderness area south of Alaska, um, the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness in central Idaho. Uh, to get to the class location, students will hike in 35 miles from a remote trailhead, and they will stay for the better part of three months. At, this is a picture of Taylor Ranch here in this slide. Um, they will experience an integrated curriculum of five courses, uh, including river ecology, outdoor leadership, wilderness policy, West American literature, and environmental thing. And there will be some access to textbooks, um, but relatively limited access to reading materials and writing technologies. There will be internet capacity, but um, limited. But unparalleled access to the subject matter, uh, to wolves, mountains, elk, bears, salmon, otters, rivers, and so forth. So in a way we're trading some of the conventional conveniences and tools of academia today uh, for access to our subject matter. Um, I will have uh, one textbook flown in on a mail plane, um, and it, this will be the, the book called Literature and the Environment, a Reader on Nature and Culture, the new edition. And we will primarily rely on this for the course, and then I have a few additional readings. Even when I'm using one of my own textbooks, I always usually have a few other readings that I provide um, as handouts to supplement um, the content. So um, I'm trying to keep track of the time here because I know we're just the first session of many today. Um, so I'd like to run through the general uh, layout of this course and the kinds of assignments that I'm hoping to use. Uh, we are still working on the actual structure. This complicated course with seven instructors and five separate courses interwoven with people coming and going all the time. This, the group, the cohort of 17 students will be together the entire time, but the instructors will be uh, circulating in and out of the field station. So I will be present for three three-week sessions, or three one-week sessions, two of them out at the Taylor Ranch in the wilderness, and the third session will be at something called the McCall Outdoor Science School in the small town of McCall in southern Idaho. Uh, we will start by focusing on a daily field journal, uh, and then some of these other building blocks. Uh, kinds of assignments, um, descriptions of animals, one of the ways of taking advantage of uh, contact with various other species will be to um, give students a chance to, to write about the fish and the birds and the insects and presumably some of the, the larger wildlife um, that they may encounter. Um, also to begin very short exercises in narrative writing, um, including an animal encounter and then in, uh, in animal analysis, where they're maybe moving into slightly more abstract forms of writing. Um, also uh, describing physical characteristics of place, and then um, some aspect of an experience of, of uh, happening over time 
uh, related to place, which would require narrative prose, and then very quickly moving into the more discursive, reflective mode. And then finally, at the end of the first session, a personal essay where they interweave these various modes of expression, particularly emphasizing the more concrete modes for this first uh, session of the course, the relatively rudimentary session. Uh, session two, again, beginning a daily journal, but we're starting to um, not progress exactly, but, but develop into the more abstract or reflective uh, mode of writing. Um, so um, I would ask the students in their second, the second phase of their daily journal when I return about a month later to continue the course that they um, be thinking in a more analytical and abstract way about their experience. Um, we will also uh, conduct, have the students conducting an interview because interviews and dialogue are very important parts of um, effective um, nonfiction prose. Also have them develop brief arguments um, and uh, learn how to make a claim and, provide, and offer evidence. And then offering uh, assignment number 11, a more abstract anal a philosophical analysis. Um, and the point for me of having these many short assignments is partly to allow the students to practice somewhat distinct modes of expression so that they can begin in a basic way to get an understanding that there are different styles of writing that they might command and use um, for certain purposes. And then finally, in the, the last session of the course, which will take place at, at the McCall Outdoor Science School, um, I will actually be teaching at this point together with two uh, professors of conservation social science and we will be talking a lot about wilderness issues and public policy and the students will be working collectively on final papers either white papers or policy statements or testimonials that might be given at some kind of public meeting and they will be drawing upon the various modes of, of writing that they have practiced throughout this intensive course um, but working with co-authors and preparing both a written text and an oral presentation, which I hope will give them a sense of um, the, the, the complexities and the importance of uh, working as a team in certain uh, situations, and then also not only uh, producing a written document, but often having to present their work out loud. So just a very brief overview of the structure of some of these classes. When I'm with the students, we will have about six hours a day of instruction. So initially, we'll be talking about the habit of writing and the way writing enables us to pay greater attention to the world. And the exemplar of, of that idea of using daily writing to engage with the, the experience of the world is Henry David Thoreau. We don't have any samples of Thoreau's work in the anthology literature and the environment, but I, I have done a lot of work over the years with Thoreau's journal and we'll give them about a week's worth of entries um, as a little handout in order to inspire them to begin observing the world around them and recording in, in intricate detail these observations. And so I'll have them, uh, we'll, we'll look at some examples of writing, I'll send them out to begin doing their own written work and then we'll hold workshops and debriefings where we'll talk about problems that students encounter in their writing or what they've accomplished in these various writing tasks. Uh, this is the way I tend to, to run all of my courses in a shorter period of time or a longer period. The, uh, written examples, student work, and then a kind of workshop or de debriefing mode. Um, then we will also, in the afternoon, begin talking about paying attention to ourselves as animal beings, and one of the small texts that we'll look at will be Patty Ann Rogers' poem called Not, um, where she examines her own way of interacting with the world, the way her mind functions, um, separating things, um, pulling them apart, and then knotting them together, weaving them back together. So, for instance, for if many of you may have read Thoreau's journal before, but um, this is a small passage. Um, of the kind that my students will look at, where they're looking at 
maples changing color or plants changing color in the fall. Remember, this course will take place in the fall. So in a way, there will be an important or an appropriate overlap between Thoreau's work and what the students are writing about in the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness, uh, observing all the different plants and their various stages of autumnal transition. Uh, Patty Ann Rogers, a uh, great nature poet, and this is from the latter part of her poem where she has spent the better part of the day isolating, undoing, separating, um, you know, in, in the way that the human imagination often functions, and then nature functions to pull everything back together. And in fact, this is how her own language um, um, reflects the natural integrative process. And so this is a very visual and psychological poem, and I think it does a good job of showing how uh, very um, uh, vivid and precise and attentive language might capture the human animal experience. Then in the second session of the course, uh, we'll be focusing a little bit more on the mode of place rather than animality. And we'll be moving after some initial grounding in the, the um, physical nuts and bolts, um, the descriptive and narrative writing into a more expository mode, uh, reading work by writers like Scott Russell Sanders and Wendell Berry. And um, one of my favorite essays to use when I'm trying to teach people in a hurry the various distinctive modes of, of environmental communication is Wendell Berry's essay, A Country of Edges, that's in his early book called uh, Recollected Essays. And it's hard for me to present it to you in this webinar in brief, but it, it's a beautiful essay about um, river country in Kentucky, and um, it's about erosion and the way these gullies are shaped by um, rivers and by rainfall and the er erosive processes. And he uses description, narration, expository meditation, and then and an interweaving of these modes in separate sections of his essay that very vividly demonstrates how one might take rhetorical advantage of these modes for the way they influence and, and move audiences. So I particularly like that essay, um, but I couldn't easily present it to you um, this morning. Um, and we will be building toward a personal essay at the end of this um, second phase of the course where the students are reflecting on some aspect of their own choice related to either animality or place using description, narration, and exposition, but emphasizing the more concrete physical modes, because I think a lot of students have more trouble with these. These aren't necessarily prioritized in earlier writing experiences they've had, so I want them to be trained to do these types of writing, because I believe very sophisticated um, writers, some of our very best writers, use these concrete sensory modes of expression in their their um, um, essays for various purposes. So they, you know, I do think our students need some exposure to these. And so, uh, one of the major examples of a writer in this unit of the course who writes very beautifully about place in both philosophical and uh, visceral and and sensory modes is Scott Russell Sanders. And we'll particularly look at um, this. Uh, a passage from his essay, Buckeye. Sorry for the misspelling of the word from there. Um, but it's particularly about the importance of writing about place if we feel places are endangered and if we had um, noticed these places and communicated our uh, attachment to these places, we might do a better job of not allowing places to be destroyed. So in a way, it's an essay about writing that I think will help to reinforce students' encounters with writing. Um, now, as I move toward the end of my own uh, part of this uh, webinar, my, my talk, um, we're in the third mode here, the, three, the se seven days in the McCall Outdoor Science School, um, working together here with, with two social scientists who focus on wilderness policy, and we'll be reading more, more um, uh, political pieces at this point, 
Rick Bass's Wolf Palette focuses on wolf reintroduction issues. Um, Edward Abbey's Shat Shadows from the Big Woods is a protection of place type of essay. We'll, t we'll look at some examples of speeches because some of the students may be working together as teams to write um, public testimony statements. Um, so Rachel Carson's essay here is actually a commencement speech. Amory Levin's piece is a speech. Um, particularly, I'm interested in Terry Tempest Williams' um, Senate or Congressional testimony from 1995, which will be a handout. And then also we'll look at some more abstract pieces of, of writing that are kind of philosophical analyses and arguments. Um, so Terry Tempest Williams, a um, very poetic, lyrical writer, has often switched modes to, to a less lyrical, more concrete uh, plea to Congress to do certain things. Um, in this case, um, pay attention to the importance of protecting wilderness in southern Utah, her home state. Um, and then the final project we're still working out the details of this, and it's a rather complicated thing for us to do as a team of instructors, but I believe it's quite important for people to learn how to write as a team. It's very cumbersome, of course, to work with a large team of co-authors, but the idea that people might take on portions of a larger, complicated project and take the lead to draft these portions and then knit them together with what colleagues are doing seems very important. I often find myself needing to co-author material these days with my colleagues, and yet I was never trained to do this when I was a student. Um, and particularly because I think a lot of the students in this course, this in Semester in the Wild course, will be scientists. Um, they are often going to find themselves in situations where they are co-authoring manuscripts um, and would like them to realize that there are some strategies that they might use uh, in working together, um, like parceling out a bigger project into pieces and then finding a way to synthesize the voices. Um, and then also the, the idea of doing an oral presentation seems very important. And um, you know, many students may be more comfortable just um, writing down their ideas and not necessarily speaking to a group. But Practice makes perfect, and I'm hoping that, or we are hoping that presenting together will help help to make the students more comfortable uh, speaking aloud. So the point of this immersive, experiential, interdisciplinary approach to environmental writing, and of all wilderness education more generally, is to provide an intellectually and personally transformative experience for students. We hope this will help them counteract the increasing abstractness and non-situatedness of the internet era, learning to ground their philosophies in realities of place, their intellectual lives in pragmatic, engaged citizenship. So this is a, my summing up of the whole point of this type of course. But I would say that the, many of the principles of this very specialized wilderness course apply quite well to every other um, teaching and learning context I have been involved with, even highly urban contexts. And I have, I once taught for a year at the University of Tokyo in Japan and worked with students who announced on the first day of class that nature was irrelevant to their lives in Tokyo. And so that was our starting point on day one. And it was my point to suggest to them that nature is relevant no matter where we are. There is a natural world and by writing and reading and reflecting together on these topics, we can learn um, you know, the full array of our attachments to the planet. So at this point, I'd like to stop my presentation. It's been about half an hour and open things up for, for your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. I, um, I have a two-part question here from Madison Griffin at the University of Idaho, who's wondering, um, part one, how might you include elements of eco-composition using writing examples that are not technically nature writing? And the second part of that question is, how might eco-composition be woven into more general rhetoric classes? 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I, um, because I, I start usually from the premise that many of my students have not um, have not read a lot of environmental writing. Um, I used to use the term nature writing a lot when doing this work. Now I, I use a broader phrase of environmental writing. And um, I would say that many uh, modes of writing, many examples of writing, are not explicitly about nature, but they do involve uh, contact with, with the world, with, um, um, with place, with uh, resources of one kind or another. Um, I would say uh, I, I do like to use examples of, of nature-related literature when I'm teaching this kind of course, um, primarily because they jolt students out of their sense that, that um, they're um, uh, removed from nature, that, that nature is somehow distant and abstract and, and not part of their lives. Um, so uh, norm, normally I do use works that are more explicitly uh, connected with nature. I'll have to think a little bit about some examples of, of work that is not environmental at all because I tend to read almost everything into that vein, into that perspective. Um, I, I would say that the, that the nuts and bolts of composition that I've tried to outline here, the description, narration, and ex exposition modes apply to any thematic um, uh, categories. So um, I, I do think in a relatively elementary course, it can be helpful, as I said earlier, to separate these artificially. Um, you know, actual professional writers use them in tandem with each other, intuitively weaving them together or highlighting one of these modes or another, um, rather than separating them so artificially. I would say this applies to any rhetorical situation. It need not be an environmental context, um, but I think it would. It, it's good to offer some kind of foundational approach in order to get the students thinking about about language very concretely and and consciously. Um, so I don't think I answered the question about not u using non-nature writing very well, but I, I'll have to reflect on that a little bit further. I was wondering also about um, the journaling. I know that's very central um, to what you're what you'll be doing in the um, in the intensive course. And I was wondering, um, when you uh, have the students approach the journal, is it all free form, or do you suggest um, topics or require specific topics? Yeah, thanks. Well, it's remember, we have a model. Mm -hmm. We're particularly using Thoreau's journal as a model, and it's very observational. Mm -hmm. And so this, I would ask the students simply to uh, find something that captures their attention of, at this new place. They will be relatively new to this place. Often I emphasize seasonality. Um, no matter where you are, um, you are uh, present in the, in the changing seasons. And one of the great things about autumn is that it is a relatively transitional time of year. So there usually are markers of seasonal change that are somewhat attention-getting. And this is that the primary focus of Thoreau's journal, both in autumn and in spring, is seasonal change. He was attempting to capture the rhythms of the external world and link them um, to the rhythms of, of his own life, his mind and his body. So I often will suggest that people pay some attention to seasonal change in their journal entries. Um, one of the aspects of our uh, 21st century disconnection from the physical world, the natural world, is our inattentiveness to seasonality. We eat whatever we want to eat, no matter where we live and no matter what time of year it is. And so we feel as if we hover above the earth independent of the seasons. And by paying careful attention through writing to seasonal change, we immediately become more engaged with environmental reality. And so that this is one of the topics I would suggest, but I tend not to be too 
um, de uh, demanding or, or um, directive in the, with these journal entries because I want the students simply to start paying attention. And I think this is, this is the basis of strong writing of any kind, um, learning to pay attention to things rather than to be mindless about um, aspects of our lives that we might want to uh, dig into more deeply. Well, it sounds like a really exciting class. How, how did you um, get the idea for it? I guess you've been developing it for, for quite some time, but, it's, um, but you, have other, you have collaborators. I, I kind of walked into it. This is, uh, they've been working on planning this Semester in the Wild course for the past few years, and they've had some difficulty um, recruiting students to it, not only from the University of Idaho, but from, from elsewhere. And so they've had a more um, coordinated marketing push this year. Um, so we're hoping we'll have the required number of 17 students. Um, I, I have usually taught in a typical classroom, often taking students outside, in addition to sitting in, in our classroom setting. And I've also, also taught much of this material in special workshops through uh, NEH-sponsored um, faculty uh, institutes. Um, sometimes in a field like Southwestern Studies, I'll go to Texas and um, uh, lead a several-day unit on environmental literature. And then we'll do some writing workshops where we'll go out and, and the people will do a few of these exercises um, as part of their more uh, broader interdisciplinary approach to Southwestern Studies. Or uh, once did a workshop for um, the uh, National Organization for Professional Writers working at university extension programs who didn't necessarily know about environmental writing per se. So we went to the Desolation Wilderness area near Lake Tahoe when they were at a, a national conference up at a casino in Tahoe and spent the afternoon doing these writing exercises um, out in the wilderness. Um, so I've done smaller versions of this, but it, it made sense that a field like writing be combined with some of the more scientific and social scientific topics for uh, this Semester in the Wild program. And what we're still working on, though, is how to integrate the five different courses that will be offered to the students for credit as part of this. And um, so writing will be part of all of them, but it will also receive special attention through um, the material that I'll, that I'll present to the students. Well, it sounds like a great, uh, great experience for you as well as for the students. So I hope the, I hope the class makes and that maybe um, a year from now you'll, you'll come back and tell us how it went. Thank you. Thanks for being with us, Scott. I know it was Thank early for you. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Amy. OK. Bye, bye now. Bye, everyone. OK, our next, our next session will begin in about 15 minutes. So stay tuned.